Thank you, David. And I really want to <coughs> thank the EPI for the fantastic role that you have played in bringing evidence to bear in the policy debate. And I'm saying this because it's still a field with, which most people would consider more an art than a science. So the role of evidence in shaping education, I think, is still quite limited. And I think you've done an amazing job here. Certainly, the reason why you know about OECD's work comes mainly through the EPA, where we've done many of our launches. I was asked to talk about what England can learn from other countries, and I'm happy to do that. But I want to preface this by saying that actually there's a lot that the world can and is learning from England. Think about higher education financing. England is years ahead of uh, many other countries in Europe and in the world. Now you think about you know scaling early childhood education in a very short period of, of history. It's a great example. We think about the pupil premium, matching resources with needs. I think there are lots of examples, actually, which other countries have taken notice of and actually are looking at. So take this as a preface in everything I'm saying from now on. I want to just start to give you a sort of, a, in a nutshell, a picture of learning outcomes. And I'm looking at science in our PISA assessment because that was the subject that we focused on in 2015. And it wasn't the first time that we did this. We did that the first time in 2006, and you know, 2006 is a very long time ago for this fast-paced world. No? One way you can remember it, it was a year before the iPhone was invented. No? Didn't have smartphones in 2006. This is really hard to imagine. Twitter was still a sound. The Amazon was still a river. Any of the kind of developments that we take for granted did not exist in 2006. But when you actually look at science learning outcomes in English education, they remain totally unchanged. Not that students didn't learn more things, but when you actually test the capacity to think like a scientist, to design an experiment, you know, to, to find out what is scientifically investable, to understand the nature of science, no change. And the world didn't stop in 2009, you know, maps became dynamic, cars became electric, now they drive without a driver, lots of changes. Now once again, you know, it didn't translate into the way we learn and teach science. And if you just imagine the last few years, you know, think about robotics, cloud computing, biogenetics, big data, all of those developments that shape our world, and they didn't translate, you know, strengthen the capacity of science, knowledge, and learning. And I'm saying this because you know, if in the past you could say science was something for a few specialists to become engineers. Today, it's the language which, which we understand and structure the world. And you know, England is not alone. You can actually see on averages across OECD countries pretty much the same thing. There are countries, you know, that have seen rapid progress. You can see sort of in Europe, Portugal is an amazing example. They went through a financial crisis and lots of difficulties, but they kept moving forward, changing what they not just improving, but changing. Or, you know, countries like Singapore move from good to great. And that's what's important. You know, the high-performing education systems don't stand still to wait for everybody to catch up. They're actually moving very, very rapidly. Much of the improvement today is actually seen at the top end of the distribution of the scale. So we need to certainly look outward. And the pressures that are going to come are going to be mounting. Think about we are just beginning to understand the impact that digitalization will have you know, on people's lives, on the way we learn, how we learn. Digitalization has been incredibly democratizing. Everybody can now contribute, participate. But it's also concentrating powers at an incredible pace. Digitalization has been incredibly particularizing. The smallest voice can be heard anywhere. Of something on Twitter, everybody can listen. But it's also homogenizing the way we think, the way we work, crushing kind of cultural uniqueness, identity, and things like that. It's incredibly empowering. You know, think about the small startups in London. You know, all you need today to be successful is a big idea. You don't need a big factory. You don't need a lot of money. You need just one idea. That is so different from 20 years ago. Yeah, everything required in the huge infrastructure. Only a few people could innovate. Today, everybody can do this. But digitalization is also incredibly disempowering. Think about you are an Uber driver these days. You know, you're just clicking and lap through this. So, and 
my argument is going to be where you end up on that slide is very much linked to your education. When you think about, you know, digital skills, that's sort of one of the ways in which we can look at this. We tested this in the adult population. When you look among older adults today, it's only about, you know, one in ten older people who have decent digital problem solving skills, navigating information, dealing with kind of ambiguity, those kinds of skills. The UK is really well placed, no? it's a one in five, but in most countries in the older population, people struggle. And now you'll tell me, well, you know, that's all solved, the young people are all digital natives, so it's all look a bit much better. And yes, it does look better, but it doesn't look good. You still only talk about, you know, every second person among the young generation who can navigate the world uh, with digital information. Singapore is incredible. No? They were the bottom, you know, in the old generation, they're at the top among the young. That gives us a sense of what's actually possible, the pace of change that we can see. Whereas you look at the UK, you know, was at the top in the older generation today, sort of more average. Huge progress, but very different in different parts of the world. And again, that gives us a sense of the pace of change that we can see. And you know, digitalization is just one of the challenges that it's going to confront the world. Probably the most kind of rapid one, uh, transforming the way we think we work and so on, socialize. But there are others as well. And the, the bottom line is that the kind of knowledge with which the world is dealing is expanding exponentially. And it has so many facets. And all of those facets of knowledge are always related with people. And that's what makes education so important. Knowledge never exists in isolation. It comes from people. It's learned by and with people. And you compare that, you know, with a little box of the school curriculum. And we're, of course, trying to squeeze everything into this little box. But what happens, and I'm going to show you some data in a moment, is the moment we push the real world into this little box of the school curriculum, what's ended up in the box is often just very shallow shadows of the real discipline. You ask fourth graders in England what they think about science, and they will tell you, oh, this is amazing, you know, I can experiment, I can understand the world, and so on. They're all enthusiastic about science. You ask them at age 15, we succeeded to make this a boring school subject of formulas and equation that is completely removed from the real world. And that is part of the story. And of course, our answer is not to do things differently, but to put more and more things into this little box. It's the kind of mile wide inch deep instructional system like most schools and I'm not just talking about England I think that is a big challenge for education that we have ended up teaching lots of things at very shallow level of depth. I'm going to see some data on this in a moment. We often forget you know the underlying paradigm what's going to distinguish people from machines how we're going to complement the artificial learning and the artificial intelligence with the human quality that can leverage this. These are the challenges. And now, of course, you know, what have we learned from higher performing countries on these kind of questions? The first thing is something that will, you will be very familiar with. It's about, you know, cognitive demand, always the best predictor. We have high expectations on individual students. You can measure this in different ways, but it's always going to predict outcomes. Focus, teaching few things at great depths. This was actually brought home to me in the 2009 PISA assessment. You know, 2009, remember the middle of the financial crisis, everybody was saying, oh, we need to have more financial education in England among those countries. And then the PISA said, well, maybe we should test financial literacy. And our assumption was, well, you know, the students who have a lot of financial education are going to come up really good in financial literacy. We found no relationship whatsoever between financial education and financial literacy. Who came out on top? Shanghai and China. The students had never heard about this. But they could think like a mathematician. They had understood what probability is. They understood what the concept of a risk is. And they could extrapolate from what they knew, apply that knowledge in a totally unfamiliar novel context. That's what we often miss. It's focus teaching few things at great depth. And coherence. We are only beginning to learn, you know, 
how the brain actually understands things. If you study neuroscience a bit, you know, you'll see that the only way in which you will not learn a foreign language is by being taught, you know, one hour of French or Italian on Monday and another hour on Thursday. The brain just doesn't learn languages in this way, and particularly not in secondary school. You teach an hour of French in a sports class, and you have immediate results, particularly when you do this in the early years. We know those kinds of things. But we have not been able, not been very good to translate this into the way we learn. Now I know all the reasons. You know, it's easier to get secondary teachers and early childhood education teachers with language experience and so on. But I think coherence, modeling, meaningful learning, progression, that's what you can see in many high performing systems. You think England, you know, one of the challenges for you as a teacher is that you have to actually, first of all, figure out what you actually teach. In Japan, just just one textbook in mathematics. And now you say, well, this is, a, this is a strange system where they tell the teachers exactly what to teach. There's only one way of doing this. But be careful. The Japanese teachers are actually all involved in the development and the design of that one textbook. If you want to change a textbook, what the ministry will tell you, great, you know, help us. Join the kind of council that is actually working in your discipline on this. And you'll actually be part of the professional body that tries to improve mathematics teaching in the country. But the result is one way, or one idea, one text. That's a big challenge, I think, in a country, in many European countries, where, you know, we leave teachers a lot of challenges in figuring out what to teach. And that makes it more difficult to build the kind of coherence that we find in systems. How you can remain true to the disciplines, that's, you know, again, a huge predictor for student success on PISA. Is your teacher an expert? in what they teach, remaining true to the disciplines, but at the same time, how you want to foster the kind of cross-disciplinary thinking that's going to be the big differentiator tomorrow. Innovation to know today is no longer about you being great in one discipline, but you being able to connect the dots where the next innovation is going to come from. You being able to think like a mathematician and to think like an historian, to think like a philosopher, all at the same time. This requires quite complex pedagogical environment. Focusing on areas with the highest transfer value in a rapidly changing world, you know, teaching you something today is not going to last for your life. Understanding the structural foundations of something that you can actually extrapolate from is very important. Authenticity. Why does learning become so boring for many young people? Because it's not often thematic, problem-based, project-based, and not co-creating. The big opportunity of digitalization is yet that you can put teachers and students on the same platform, all as learners, co-creators of learning, We're not doing enough of that to see this. And then the hardest thing is some things are core, not taught. If you're in Japan, you know, as a teacher, at the end of the lesson, at the end of the school day, you will clean the classroom with your students. And that's not because they don't have money to hire a room cleaner. It's part of the pedagogical mission. We're all in this together. We take collective responsibility for our environment. That's how discipline is created, not by sort of penalizing students for their behavior. When you think about character qualities, this is where things get really difficult. That's about the learning environment and the organization. Very difficult to do. And then finally, how do you make success not just a proposition for the few, but for the many? The difficulty that we often have is that our education systems are designed by people who succeeded in them. And people who did not succeed in them have a very hard time in, in, in succeeding in our way of working. But those are a few lessons on this that we have learned from high-performing education systems. Now, you'll tell me, well, teachers know all of that. And in fact, they do. We serve it. Think about this. 96% of teachers say, my role as a teacher is to facilitate students' own inquiry. 86% say students learn best by finding solutions of their own. 74% say thinking and reasoning is more important than curriculum content. And now you think, wow, you know, that highly constructivist mindset that is exactly in line with what I've just been showing. Difficulty is, you know, what the intention is, is often not, you know, what's arriving in the classroom. And you can see that really on this data. You know, if British teachers would do what they say, you would find them at the bottom of the 
this scale where we looked at memorization as a dominant learning practice in classrooms. And this time we surveyed students, not teachers. Four, that's what teachers say. Now I'm showing you what actually happens in the classroom. No? You would find Britain at the bottom of the list, but that place is already taken by Switzerland. And then comes Poland, and then comes Germany. Actually, Britain is at the top of the list. Implemented practice is often about memorization. Had I asked you at the start of this lecture, many of you would have tipped on China. No? And probably 30 years that would have been true. Today, China uses memorization, but it's not the dominant approach to learning. And the same is true for many of the East Asian countries, like Japan, Korea, Singapore, with more. And when you look at the kind of things that teachers aspire to, reasoning, deep learning, intrinsic motivation, critical thinking, creativity, non-routine problems, you can see, you know, China is good at this as well. It's not about, you know, memorization versus those kinds of advanced elaboration strategies, but it's about finding out what's right for the right task in the right moment. I think this is a very important point that often, you know, what we think we do is actually very hard to see in the classroom. Why, when you ask Chinese teachers, their intended practices align so well with the implemented practices? Because they see those implemented practices every day. If you're a Chinese teacher, teacher in Shanghai, you teach between 11 and 16 hours per week. You have a very large class, that's how they afford it, but you teach a lot less. You spend actually at least one hour per week to look at what somebody else is doing, actually, observing somebody else's class. You will be sort of involved in lots of research and experimental practice in the school. You'll actually advance your profession. You're not implementing what somebody else told you to do, but you're going to be a designer of innovative learning environments. At least you're supposed to do. Not everybody does it, that's true, but actually that's the aspiration of our teaching. And you can see that in the results in the implemented learning practice. Now there are still people who say, well, you know, memorization is a very effective kind of strategy. We've studied that. And here's some really interesting new insights on this. What I'm going to do is show you that these are tasks by their difficulty from easy to hard on this. And I'm going to show you the, uh, the, those tasks in green where memorization actually helps you to be successful. And in red, those where memorization hinders success. And what you can see is actually for very easy tasks, memorization is a good way. But as soon as tasks get more complex, memorization is rather hindering you from helping. Why is this important? Because digitalization is moving us from left to right. The kind of things that are easy to teach, easy to test, are also easy to digitize, automate, and outsource. So as time goes on, People who rely on memorization will have a harder and harder time. Control strategies. This is about you know managing your own learning strategies, setting goals, persevere, and so on. These are things that you can really well teach, teaching students how to learn. And you can see that's good for almost the entire spectrum of tasks. But you can still see that you know as tasks get really complex, those kinds of structures help you less and less get to the very top, the most complex problems, and this is where, you know, human qualities are the key. There is what we call elaboration strategies is the kind of key to success. Your capacity to connect what you know with what you don't know, to be open to divergent thinking, think out of the box, to connect familiar with unfamiliar knowledge. And those are those are dimensions which require really innovative learning environments. Now, they can be sort of, it's very difficult to can them in any way to teach them anyway. But there is also a warning sign. You know, some people say project-based learning is the key to everything. Well, you can see if you use, you know, project-based learning to teach people the multiplication tables, you're actually going to be on the left side and you're going to waste a lot of student learning time. So the key really is balance, managing all of this. But Britain is high on memorization and really very low on that kind of elaboration paradigm that is so important at the top end of the distribution scale. And that's in, in a nutshell what you see. And you can see a country like or a system like Shanghai in China that actually is pretty strong on those kinds of things. So what can we learn? What can we take away from this? A couple of points. The first is an obvious one. 
in the past, you know, we only needed a very few people to succeed and everybody else to get foundations built. Today, you know, the cost that you have as a society for educational failure, even in a small group, is huge. The economic cost, the social cost is even larger. Getting everybody to succeed. Some people say, well, that's, you know, an elusive goal because people are born with different talents. Well, look at the PISA data. There are countries where every student does succeed in mathematics. And I use that subject because that's the one where we most firmly believe that's a matter of talent. In fact, when we ask people, that's what they say. The second issue is, you know, and I mentioned just this, you know, to move from routine cognitive skills to enabling complex ways of thinking, complex ways of doing, to build the kind of social skills that matter for success. And the challenge is that that requires a very different caliber of teaching. You can teach routine cognitive skills with standardization and compliance, you know, telling people what to do. If you want to teach complex ways of doing, you have to have a very different kind of approach. That requires high-level professional knowledge work. The difficulty is that, you know, professional knowledge workers don't like to work in tailoristic work organizations. And that's pretty much what sort of we often do. That we have sort of organized our schools like factories where teachers teach, and there's a social worker, school psychologist, room cleaner, and so on. And that's a work environment where it's very easy to pass responsibility to someone else. Actually, you look towards the most successful education systems, teachers have a much wider range of responsibilities. They're actually in charge of student well being. That's the, that's the key. If you ask a teacher in the barn, you know, what's your role? That's what they will tell you. This is my job to actually help students to succeed in their life, and my success is a student's success in life, not the final examination. And that's reflected in work organization. I'm going to show you some more data on this in a moment. And of course, it has implications on accountability systems. It's easy to move information upwards in a system. It's actually much harder to have, help people learn from each other, learn with each other, to build a kind of lateral accountability systems that actually are very very successful in some countries. You look to Finland, you know, some people say Finland has no accountability system. Actually, that's totally wrong. You know, Finland has a much tougher accountability culture than many countries that you, th you might think of. And I can actually show you evidence for this. In Finland, there's only 5% of the performance variation amongst, in, in the student population that lies between schools. Every school succeeds. That doesn't fall from the sky. That means every school knows what every school is doing, and every school is doing something about it when it is underperforming. So, but those systems of accountability are built, you know, based on lateral networks, not on hierarchical structures. Let's have a look at this in a little bit more detail. First, you know, can we help every student to be successful? You know, in 2012, when we had mathematics at the focus, <coughs> we asked students, what do you believe makes you successful in mathematics? And we had the majority of students in England who said, well, that's obvious, you know, it's talent. You know, if I'm not born as a genius, I'm going to study something else. If you ask that same question to a student in Singapore or in China, nine out of 10 students tell you, if I study really, really hard, I trust my teacher is going to help me and I'm going to be successful. So that is this kind of gross mindset. I'm going to invest whatever it takes, and I know my teacher is going to help me to succeed. And the result is it actually helps. You do not see the kind of level two or level one performance that we have got used to in our education systems in Europe. So it is possible to help all students succeed at high levels. Here you see some interesting data. You know, the first thing when we show international comparisons is always, you know, you compare apples with pears. You know, students from different social contexts and different countries, it just doesn't make any sense. So let's solve that problem. Let's compare apples with apples. Here I show you the student learning outcomes by decile of social background. The red square are the 10% the most disadvantaged students in the Dominican Republic. The green triangle are the 10% wealthiest students in the Dominican Republic. And you can see there's a huge achievement gap. Some people read this and they say, well, you know, poverty is destiny. There's not anything you can do about it. But if that was true, you would find the same picture in every country. But you actually don't. You can see that similar students, now we have apples and oranges, all sorted, 
you can see similar students from similar social backgrounds come out hugely different. If you look at the 10% most disadvantaged students in Vietnam or Estonia or Hong Kong, they perform as well as the average student in the industrialized world. And they form better than the 10% wealthier students in much of Latin America. <coughs> I think it's a very powerful illustration that poverty is not destiny, that you know we can get it right for students from all social backgrounds. How do you do that? Well, unfortunately, money is sort of the intuitive solution, but it only works up to a point. You know, you can see if you spend very little on the left side, money spending per student clearly relates to learning outcomes. But you soon get to a point where, you know, spending alone doesn't explain very much. Spending per student is not a good predictor for the quality of learning on average across OECD countries. Because in blue, you have the countries of the OECD. It's more, you know, among the low-performing countries that money can make more of a difference. Attracting the resources where they can make most of a difference, that is a much bigger part of the answer. If you are in the green part of the chart, you are capable to attract the more talented teachers to the more challenging classrooms. That's the blue dots. And no, the red, the red diamonds. And you get the better resources to the more disadvantaged classrooms. If you're in the red part, it means if you're in a disadvantaged area, we're also going to give you the worst teacher and the lower quality education resources. And you can actually see most countries are deeply in the red part. Most of our education systems are highly regressive in the way they allocate resources. Here I want to credit the UK, and I've put you really almost at the extreme. Because the pupil premium has really changed that dynamic. It has linked resources with needs, and you can see that in the data. In the past, I think that was on the left side. Now when it comes to the blue dot, you can actually say disadvantaged schools have more resources than privileged schools on average. What's interesting though, it worked on material resources, the blue part. It did not work with regard to the quality of human resources. And that's another important lesson. It's not just about you know, giving more money to a disadvantaged school. The challenge, the harder challenge is how do you attract the most talented teachers to the most challenging classrooms. That's really, I think, where resource difference makes such a huge kind of impact. And that's again something where we can certainly learn from some of the Asian countries that have built all career structures around disadvantage. If you're a vice principal in a high performing school and one day you want to become principal, the only way to make that transition is to take on a tougher school. Same for a teacher. I think that's a very, very, but that's hard to do. You know, that's not to, and money alone is not a good lever. If you want to actually motivate people to change their school with salary bonuses, which some people try, you've got to pay like differentials of 30, 40, 50 percent, and you still not succeed. Money is not the greatest motivator for teachers. What matters a lot more is the kind of support structure you build for them. Am I going to be left alone in this low-performing school, or will I have going to be access to experience, to mentors, to other people who help me in this? Is somebody going to take care of my family, my housing, all of this? Those things matter a lot more than salary differentials, but they're harder to implement. Fewer people do that. Another point that I think is really important, we ask ourselves, where does the performance variation come from? Yeah? And one answer is, of course, the quality of schooling differs. Well, actually, if you look at this in the case of the UK, that's actually not a big part of the problem. Less than 30%, you know, about 20% of the performance variation that we observe among students lies between schools. And I think that's grossly underestimated in the public debate. The public debate, you often, as you know, oh, we need to find out what the underperforming schools are, and then we go there and we do something about it. And most of the accountability structures are focus on school performance. But you can only address 20% of the challenges. The big part of the performance variation lies within schools. And the same is to do with social background. You might think, well, you know, the underperforming schools are all the disadvantaged schools. Actually not. You can find many high-performing, many privileged environments in England, underperforming schools. 
surprising. But it's what the PISA data uh, show in comparison to other countries. The link is not that clear. And the variability is strong. What this means, what this chart really tells you, is that there are many students from na many neighborhoods in many regions which underperform, not just something that you can put quite at the school. And that makes it much harder to deal with policy wise. Because it means really, you know, you need to actually address issues in lots of schools with lots of teachers and get, you know, teachers better at diagnosing underperformance, at developing intervention and building a kind of more flexibility into the learning environments to address the, this problem. I, but I think this is one of the charts that I feel is often underappreciated in the public debating. You know, in my country, Germany, this is by design. But between performance uh, school variations by design because students are routed to academic and vocational tracks and so on, you can understand this in, if people had the courage, they could actually address it. They could build a more uniform schooling system. But in your case, I think it's going to be really hard because you need to deal with lots of people in the system to actually affect real change. How do you advance from a system that tells people what to do to a system that is really building ownership for, for our professional practice. I give you an ex another example from Shanghai. And I know there's a lot of exchanges now between China and England, and I think that there are some really important lessons, you know. They have a digital platform where teachers share their lesson plans and projects and ideas, and now you will tell me, well, we have that too. Right. But the difference is, the way they use it in Shanghai is really interesting. They combine that with a reputational metric. So the more other teachers are going to download your lessons, criticize your lessons, improve your lessons, use your lessons, the more you rise in status. And at the end of the school year, your principal will not only ask you, you know, how well did you teach the students in your class, but what contribution did you make to the profession? How did you actually change things? In England, you do that in academia. It's a natural thing for people to do. That actually was driving the success of people. And in the schooling se sector, we still have this very industrial working model where we believe somebody else has thought about these things and I just need to deliver them. This is a big, big difference, building ownership of professional practice, building the kind of structures. And it comes to time use. Let me show you a couple of data points on this. But first, you know, developing teaching as a profession has something to do with who you get, very clear. It has a lot to do with how you support people, how you retain great teaching, and also how you actually improve the social view on the teaching profession. Let me start with the last. This is the share of teachers who say that their profession is valued in society. So you can see it's one third of teachers in England. Actually, this is not the UK, this is just England. One third of teachers in the UK who think my profession is valued by society. Two thirds of teachers go every day to a place where they think you know, society doesn't respect them. If you are in Malaysia and in Singapore and Korea and so on, you have a very high appreciation for the job. This is not necessarily the truth, this is teachers' own perception. But, you know, if you do not perceive your profession to be appreciated, that you want to become a teacher, or do you want your child to become a teacher? And it gets more interesting than that. You can actually line that up with results on PISA. And you can see that actually the share of teachers who believe their profession is valued leaps with the share of top performers on the PISA scale. It's not so clear what's cause and effect. It could go both ways. It could be that, you know, where you have great teachers, they do a great job, students learn a lot, and society will appreciate that. But it could also be where society values teaching. More great people want to become teachers. They're going to end up doing a great job, and the results will be good. We do not know that from the data, but don't ignore the link. The link, I think, is one that is important. And you know, when you ask yourself what's driving the attractiveness of the profession, it's easy to make teaching materially attractive and pay people well. It's much harder to make teaching intellectually attractive. And that's the key challenge that I'm going to talk about in a moment. But let's see, you know, who's becoming a teacher. You know, you read a lot of reports who say that top performing countries get uh, recruit their teachers from the top third of the graduate distribution. I hear that all the time. So I wanted to find out. So I actually 
the tested gradients. These are the test scores of numerous skilled among graduates. Here you can see Japan and Finland do quite well, Spain and Poland do not so well. But now the question is, where do teachers come into this? And here's the answer. In most countries, teachers are pretty normal people. There's no country in the world where actually teachers come from the top third of the graduate distribution. Not one. And it's also clear, you know, because everybody wants to have the best teacher. Lawyers want to have them, the economists want to have them, teacher professionals. In most countries, teachers are pretty normal people, but they vary. You know, if you look to Japan and Finland, teaching is more attractive than the average graduate job. And it's interesting, Finland. Finland doesn't pay its teachers particularly well. Teacher salaries are so so. It's intellectual attractiveness of the profession, you know, great collegial work environment, uh, continued professional development interesting careers, working with parents, having a kind of broad set of responsibilities. Those things really, really matter. Norway is interesting, and you might think Norway is like Finland, somewhere in the north of Europe, but actually the graduates do quite well, the teachers don't do well. Norway, becoming a teacher in Norway is not very attractive. So you can actually see, this. I'm not talking about culture, I'm really talking about features that we can influence. And you look to Poland, at the bottom of the list and teachers. Teaching is also very unattractive. But coming back to England, you can see basically, you know, teachers in England are pretty normal people. Can compare quite well in the average numeracy skills to the average graduate. And what this data really show is that, yes, it's very important when you get into teaching, but it's not the magic key. If you wait for spaceship that is going to bring you new teachers one day, you're going to wait for a very long time. Right? And you're only going to change the incoming cohort. Right? You're going to change 2 or 3% of the teaching population every year. If you want to actually achieve change at scale, you need to do something different. And that is invest in the, in the profession. And this is about creating work environment. Let me show you some data on that. On the vertical axis, I show you the student-teacher ratio. Now, that's how generous you are as a system. The lower you are, the more teachers do you have for every 100 students. On the horizontal axis, I show you the class size. How many students sit in the class? And intuitively, you might think, well, they should be the same thing. You know, I have more teachers, and then I can make my classes smaller. But you can see they're actually almost completely unrelated. Let me show you two examples, England and China. You have virtually the same student-staff ratio. England and China are equally generous in teacher supply to their student population. But China has a class size that is so much larger than class sizes in England. And you ask yourself, you know, how can that be? What are those teachers doing? And the answer is precisely, you know, those teachers doing lots of things other than teaching. They spend so much more time working with individual students, working with their parents, observing other teachers' classrooms. And they pay for that with a larger class. If you compare that with England, it's one of the countries where teachers have least non teaching work, least opportunities to do other things than teaching. Somebody else in the school has taken that job. It's kind of very kind of tailorized. But it is also imposing the kind of limits I spoke with at the beginning. Let's have a look at some of the details here. Teaching hours, long teaching hours. Working days are rela working hours are relatively short, and people are not sort of working that hard. But actually, teaching hours are hard, so little time for other things in teaching. And that has changed a bit, but not that much. If you look at salaries, actually, I should add to this that uh, teachers' uh, salaries in England actually fell quite a bit in real terms in the last decade. It's true for many other public se sectors as well. On average across countries, they rose. And that actually means that England now pays their beginning teachers a lot less than most other countries do. It was very different 10 years ago. England ranked quite well. Now, sort of, it's an issue. But what the advantage of the system still remains that there's a good career prospect. So there's a big salaries differential between start and end salaries. I think that's a positive sign of the system. But overall, you know, watch that out in the long term, it's going to have an effect. Learning time. If you add one more hour of mathematics learning, you get better math outcomes. 
you add one more hour of science learning, you get better science outcomes. Learning time within each country is a quite reliable predictor of better performance. And it, I would think, you know, the UK is doing quite well in giving students reasonably long school days. It works within a country. But now look at this chart. I'm showing you this how it works across countries. On the horizontal axis, I show you the time that students spend learning. And on the vertical axis, the PISA score. And look how this works. The longer students spend in school, the worse they come out in PISA across country. And you ask yourself, you know, how can that actually be? But you know, you don't need to think that long. Actually, the answer is quite straightforward. Learning is always the product of the quantity of learning and the quality of teaching. It's the product of those two things. They both matter. You can actually see that very well. Here you can see learning time in blue and school. Here you can see time out of school, homework, things that, you know, go beyond teaching. And you can see countries vary hugely on this. You look to, you know, the United Arab Emirates, students learn close to 60 hours. In Finland, on the left side, a little more than half of that, 35 hours. Huge differences in the volume of learning time. But now when you ask yourself, you know, what do you actually learn per hour, it goes like this. In Finland, Germany, Switzerland, Japan, Estonia, students spend little time and learn a lot. In the United Arab Emirates, students spend a lot of time and learn very little. In a nutshell, you know, you can always achieve better results by putting more time on top of the system. But that's a very costly way of improving outcomes, particularly for the students. You're much better off by improving the quality of the learning environment and get the, the, the black diamond at a higher level. Enormous differences across countries. I think it really shows us how much there is to learn by improving quality of learning. How do we move systems, you know, from this upward perspective to a perspective where our teachers are more connected, more integrated, feel part of a profession, have more ownership of professional practice? I mean, this is where you find huge differences between the education profession and other that see themselves very naturally as, you know, uh, professionals. You know, I'm, I'm a scientist by nature. My background is physics. It would have never come to my mind that there were a mini ministry of physics that tells people what to do and what to think. So if you're growing up with being embedded in the profession, you learn with peers, you don't mind where they come from. And that's something that in education is still very much emerging. There are not many kind of national, not to speak international networks of professions, of professionals that we have, but they are really important. Think about professional collaboration. When it happens, it's usually very kind of loose, loose about exchange and coordination. Teachers spend time discussing individual student results, sharing resources, team conferences, and so on. But when you get to the more deeper forms of professional collaboration, they're quite rare. Classroom observation, one joint activities, collaborative professional development, team teaching. It's still quite rare. It varies across countries, and some countries are those marks are higher, but overall, teachers do not spend that much time on the kind of deeper forms of professional collaboration that really drive the professional practice. Why do I say this? Have a look at this. You know, the more teachers teach jointly, the more they observe other teachers' classes, the more they engage in joint activities, the more they take part in coll collaborative professional learning, the greater their level of self effects The more they believe, they can make a difference in classes. That doesn't mean they're actually making a difference. We can't measure this, this is, but it tells you that they actually have this sense of ownership of their profession. In fact, professional collaboration is the best predictor for t uh, teacher self-efficacy. And it's the best predictor for teacher job satisfaction. We could find only very modest relationship between pay conditions and employment conditions and teacher job satisfaction. Surprisingly, at least when we measure this, maybe our measures are not good, we could find no relationship between the size of the class and teacher's job satisfaction. Surprisingly, or consistently, but those are big predictors. This is big. And, and the good thing is that these things come by divine. These things are ones that we can actually build in the work organization of schooling. They're not falling from the sky. They're actually things that we can actually do. 
how do we move from you know a system that is very prescriptive delivered to something where we rely more on professionals to create innovative learning environments and the key to this lesson that we draw it's really about three things it's about professional knowledge knowing something about what you teach knowing something about students knowing something about learning science this kind of professional knowledge is one predictor professional autonomy to what extent are you incentivized to actually become a designer of innovative learning environments in your class and don't take this for granted 72 percent of teachers perceive their school to be an innovation hostile environment that may not be true, but that's their perception. They say they rather get penalized than rewarded for doing things differently. The biggest frustration teachers express in England and many other countries as well is they do if they do a good job, nobody notices. There is no recognition, there's no public recognition <coughs> for great work, and there's very little professional uh, recognition. And the last one I've just shown you is the collaborative culture very very important driver of you know, many things outcomes but also self-efficacy and job satisfaction and it's really about you know the, the challenge is you know how do you move from a system that is relying very much on ex external pressures you know trying to force people to change their behavior towards giving them the internal motivation that actually drives professional practice I was involved in the Netherlands in a very interesting policy effort and they wanted to develop teacher professional standards and they were worried about you know the government couldn't do it because as you know the Netherlands is a system of voucher schools every school is a charter school or academy in your terminology so the government has very little direct influence on this so they basically made this open to the profession and then there were many people myself included who said well you know how do you know the result is going to be serious if people try to develop their own kind of professional standards well, you know, we were always surprised. What came out as a result, the Dutch professional teaching standards are more ambitious than anything any government could have done. The moment the profession actually started to think about, you know, what is it that defines success? What is it? What does it mean to be a good teacher? They were very rigorous, very ambitious. Very. And I think this is something that we often forget. It's the same, you know, when teachers complain that we, we ask in our Thales survey, teachers boast, you know, how much time do you spend working and teaching? And then we ask them about job satisfaction. You don't find internationally any relationship. You know? Teachers who like their job actually don't complain about the time they spend. It's when teachers do not appreciate their job, then even small amounts of time become a burden. And I think that is the challenge, really, that uh, building a kind of professional environment that teachers can know. Past was divided, you know, we basically have teachers and content divided by subjects and student destinations and so on. And uh, schools are very good in keeping students inside and uh, the world outside. And the question really of our times is how can we build more integrated learning environments, more open learning environments. That's the one thing that technology really enables. You don't hear me talk about technology a lot because I must say so far our kind of evidence is not very positive on this many environments technology does more damage than good. not because the technology is a problem but because we have 21st century technology we have 20th century pedagogy and a 19th century school organization that doesn't work we, we lack the kind of pedagogy but I think the future really is about this building very different innovative open environments and many high performing countries actually don't start with the students they start with the teachers like the example I mentioned from Shanghai connecting teachers building a kind of professional ownership in the system which then influences students it's about also moving from a culture of conformity compliance to a culture where ingenuity is rewarded one thing that really struck me again you know when I was in, in Shanghai if you go and say we have 50 students in the class that's too much no? we need smaller classes you go to the government you send an application and they will tell you okay we'll give you a grant it's very easy for a school to get a grant from the government for doing an experiment or doing research okay try it out come back to us in a year if at the end of the year you come back and say actually smaller classes work better they will not say yes or no they will say okay 
uh, looks interesting, try that you can actually replicate this in 10 other schools with other people in other places. Does it really work also? If you're successful, this is one day you become an experimental school. So there's an incentive for people to try out new things, not to sort of do things that other people have done. And there's a good way actually for the good ideas to bubble up and the bad ideas to disappear. How do we move from seeing learning as a place, you know, we're bringing children to school to actually seeing learning as an activity that cuts through everything? Young people do. But the way in which some education systems have succeeded to integrate schooling with learning. Korea is an interesting example. If you see people in the underground no, on their mobile phones, they're actually not necessarily chatting or so ever, they do their homework. And actually the school system can almost see how this is going to work because it's all sort of interconnected. And they have tried to sort of build an environment that is more open between the school and the non-school context. Finland is also really good at this. Science. A lot of science is taught in Finland in nature. People actually do real science in real context, not in classroom. They try to do that. It's obviously harder to do in city environments and so on. And you can also see, this is sort of one thing I, I wanted to show you as well. It's sort of, <clears throat> we studied student well-being quite a bit over the last um, years. And uh, schoolwork related anxiety is quite high in the uh, uh, in, in England, in the United Kingdom. And it's high not just among the bottom quarter of science performance that you can understand. You know, I'm anxious because I'm not doing really well. But you can see high levels of anxiety <coughs> also at the uh, top performing science schools. And now you start to wonder because uh, standards are not that high. There's no kind of reason why you would be sort of very worried as a student. But it seems the case, whereas other high-performing countries, you can look at the Netherlands, Switzerland, Finland, Estonia, and so on, where students do really well, standards are actually higher than in England, but still students don't feel that level of personal anxiety. Where does it come from? The one thing that we found quite consistently is perceived teacher support. Where students say, you know, their teacher adapts the lesson to my class needs and to acknowledge diversity, the teacher provides individual help when students have difficulty. Where students have that perception, you can really see anxiety goes down. And students have the perception that teachers were not fair or that they do not appreciate what students could be doing. Those are the drivers for anxiety. Not the difficulty of the environment, not the standards, not the kind of cognitive demand that's actually always a good predictor for performance. You know, for, for years we've been trying to look at, you know, where does it tip off? You know, when are you having too high expectations for your students? You cannot find the point. Basically, the more demands you have on students as long as it comes combined with support. When demands go without teacher support, that's where you run into those kinds of difficulties. And parents, interesting. No, where actually parents were said they were interested in a child's activities at school. Students said, I want to get top grades. I want to, I'm satisfied with my life. They were a lot less likely to feel lonely at school and not satisfied with life. It's so easy to do. And this is after controlling for social background, just by the way. You know, it doesn't take a degree. It doesn't take a lot of time to ask your child how was school. But it turned out to be a better predictor for learning outcomes in science than parental income. The simple thing, you know, asking your children how it was school, showing, you know, our children that what they do in school actually matters to us. So the parent factor is quite important. And that again is something, you know, we think that's outside the realm of schools. You cannot, you know, manage this. Have second thoughts. There's a lot we can learn from other countries. And this is the last time I bring you to China. And that's actually not something that we can so far measure, but that you can observe when you visit a school. You know, my greatest privilege is I've been in classrooms in over 60 countries. I've really seen a lot of things. And I was actually, you know, <clears throat> asking a teacher, you know, how she, in a, in a rural um, area of China, how she was managed to, managing to get parents on board. Because the world in school was so different from anything outside there. There was just nothing in the environment. And she said, well, you know, I talk to parents about twice per week. You know, I call them, I use them on WeChat, sometimes I visit them, and so on. And then I said, well, you know, that must be a huge amount of time you spend. You have 50 students in your class, you spend all of that time. 
and then she said to me, well, you know, I actually never thought about it like this, you know. If I wouldn't have all of these parents helping me in my job, I just couldn't do my job. You know, it would be totally impossible. And that's what you can see here in the data. And again, how can they do that? Because they factor this into the way in which the school works. You as a teacher are not just there to deliver a classroom. You are there to ensure students' well-being, and you do whatever it takes to get there. The concept of mastery learning was invented in the Western world. Where is it best implemented? In those countries, no student is left behind. You as a teacher do whatever it takes to get every student to achieve well on this. And parents, big part of the equation. I mean, if you look at here, three and a half times as likely, twice as likely, with a very simple variable after controlling for a social background, very powerful relationships. Last but not least, I actually, I said everything about this, you know, moving from administrative control and accountability to the kind of lateral forms of accountability moving from management to leadership in the system. That's easy to say, hard to do, building the kind of career tracks. Now that's again you know, something we can learn from becoming a, you can become a school leader in, a, in England easily, it's a separate career track. But actually, how to become a really good teacher. There's very little inward mobility within the profession. I think there's something that we can learn. It's about public versus private to moving public with private. And let me move you out of school for this just a little bit. You know. When you look, for example, at vocational programs, this is sort of one example how you can integrate the world of work and the world of learning. The UK is not placed so well when it comes to the intensity of participation. But what worries me more is that the UK is one of the countries that deliberately or systematically spends less per vocational student than for academic student. So that is a quite clear, normally in countries, you invest more in those students because it's more expensive to provide those environments and also you deal with more challenging students typically. So the case to spend more money. But in the UK, sort of the signal given to those people is, is a second choice. We're going to invest less. And I think that is something that, you know, will be worth to rethink. Also, you know, think about the quality. If you pay a plumber in a vocational school less than you pay a plumber on the market who comes to your home, guess whom you're going to be getting to become the teacher of your children. Those things really, I think, matter, and this is an area where I think the integration of public with private, the kind of increased high-quality workplace learning, I think is super. I think there's lots of promising things happening at the moment, apprenticeships and so on, but still, I think, a very important part of this. And very, very last point is about, you know, the temptation, and I think this is true for all democracies, you know, this is where we have a hard time building reforms that are systemic, that are coherent over time. One of the reasons why we are losing the trust of educators, whether it's teachers or school leaders, is because they have just seen so many things. And they basically said, well, you know, I just need to wait, and three years from now, they're going to tell me the opposite. And that is, you know, one day they say it's about competency-based learning, and then the next day they say it's about content, and then sort of, if you think about the time it takes from intended to implemented practice, think about one of the fastest moving countries in education, Japan. It takes them 10 years to devise and design a new curriculum. And the way they do this, you know, writing the curriculum is easy. Anybody can do that at any time. But then you need to think about, you know, what does it take in terms of professional uh, building? How do I engage my teachers and develop the new textbooks? How do I engage the profession? In the, how do I train teachers? How do I build ownership for those no practices? You can actually test them. We do that. We ask teachers in our service to what extent they understand and know the paradigms of a curriculum. And that's where you can see the difference. That's the time frame that you need. But it's so much longer than the kind of time spent that we typically have in a political area. Last slide. Was it a, is it all worth it? This is a share of 15-year-olds who came out really badly on the PISA test. And you can see, even among OECD countries, we tolerate that one in five students do not even have the foundations at age 15. And when I say don't have the foundations, they have not mastered the most fundamental aspects of literacy, of mathematics and science. They're never going to catch up because learning requires those kinds of foundations. What if we could fix it? You know, what if we could ensure that not everybody is becoming like students in Finland or China, but every student gets at least the minimal foundation? 
think you do that in a country like Brazil. You talk about 23 trillion US dollars in long-term economic gains. Think about the UK. You talk about 3.6 trillion US dollars. And it already shows you, you know, the cost of improvement is such a tiny fraction of a long-term economic loss. Low performance is a very high cost. Even Finland, <clears throat> even Finland could gain a lot by addressing underperformance, however limited it is. And I think this is just a, a, an issue that is not only a moral imperative, it's also becoming a huge drag on our societies. But what international comparisons do show us that it's an achievable goal. You can see actually, you know, we can achieve success not only on average, we can achieve success for every child. We can make success virtually independent of the social background of, of, of students and their families. All it takes is an, a work organization that, you know, attracts and builds the kind of capacity. Thank you very much.